Well, what a great prayer in song. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. That is our heartbeat and desire, that the earth would be filled with the glory of God and that we would magnify his name. Several years ago, um, Thomas Edward Lawrence, he was also known as Lawrence of Arabia. You may have heard of him and his name. He was a uh, British uh, military officer as well as a diplomat in the early 1900s. And on one occasion, he uh, brought a, a group of Arab men over to London uh, for part of some meetings, and he put them up in a really nice hotel, and uh, they were really blown away by the, the facility. They, they were Bedouins, so their entire lives they had lived in tents. And so you can imagine for the first time coming to a, a nice fancy hotel in, in London, and they were kind of taken aback by the whole scenario and scene. And, but the thing that, that astounded them the most was in their room, they could turn a faucet and water would come out. Now, they had lived in a desert, so for them, water was a high-priced commodity that was sometimes difficult to come by, and to be able to just turn a knob and, and out come water was astounding to them, and, and, and they were just so amazed by the entire place. Well, later after the meetings were over and Lawrence came and gathered them up and was helping them pack up their, their bags to take them out to the vehicle, to take them back to the planes and to take them back home. And he noted that their, their bags were extra heavy. And so what he, he, he said, what did you guys put in here? He opened them up and they had taken the faucets from the hotel um, because they had, in their mind, they were thinking if they could take the faucets home, they would have water. Um, back in their tents, and um, obviously he had to correct their thinking, but we, we hear that and we think, how ridiculous is that to think that we can just turn on and off something like that, and, and it would, without being tied into the source, and it would actually be prosperous. And yet sometimes I think we approach the idea of worship as if I can just turn it on and off when it's suitable, and I can come in on a Sunday, and I can worship, and I can come and sing songs and those things, but then I don't have to necessarily be tied in, spiritually speaking, to Christ through the remainder of the week. Well, it's the same idea almost, to think that we could just take the faucets with us. And, um, and so, last Sunday, uh, we started into, especially for those who uh, maybe we're not here or, or new with us. Last Sunday we began a series of really of utmost importance uh, entitled Made to Worship. Understanding what is worship. There's a lot of confusion around that today and we endeavored to lay some foundational truths from God's Word. And, um, and so we discussed that and we defined worship a few different ways. We looked at some lengthier de definitions, but we simplified worship down to all that I am responding to all that He is. Me giving all that I am in response to all that He is. Worship is all about reflecting the worth and the value of God. And so the more we ponder on that, the more we meditate on God and allow that to sink in and, and to chew over who He is and, and, and to dwell with Him and abide in Him as Jesus encouraged His disciples in John 15. Out of that comes a heart of worship. And so we went last week to John chapter number 4. It's a scenario where Jesus was talking with the woman at the well. And she asks the question, you know, our, our father said that it was in Mount Gerizim is the place to worship, but you guys say that in Jerusalem at Mount Moriah is the place to worship. And, and it seemed like that he was kind of getting off track with talking about worship to this woman who really needs to get saved. But the reality is it's not off track because God designed us and desires us to worship, and it's the heartbeat of the gospel. Because when we understand who God is and we then surrender to Jesus Christ, out of that we become worshipers. True believers will be worshipers. And so he talked to them, he said, he basically said to her that, 
that it's not about the mountain, it's not about Mount Gerizim or Mount Moriah, but there is a time coming and now is, well, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, and the Father is seeking such as to worship Him. That the true worship isn't about the external facades. True worship isn't about, about the place. True worship isn't about it being relegated to a time block. And we talked about that, that true worship isn't simply just coming in for an hour on Sunday morning and another hour on Sunday night, and that's our worship time. It's, it's beyond that. It's in all areas of our lives. It, it works out into all areas of, of how, we, how we work for our employer, how we treat our spouse and, and raise our children to honor God in doing that. And it works out into all different areas of our lives. And so really it's from the heart. It presses, he presses it back to the heart. You know, worship in spirit as a heart desire and in truth about who is this God as I study Him and, and meditate on Him and the truth of the Word of God. And so we looked at that last week and really kind of laid that foundation. And so it's not about, it's not about these external things. And... Um, it goes back to all the different areas of our lives. And the question then is, how, how do we build that? How do we strengthen that in all areas of our lives? How do I become a worshiper at work? How do I become a worshiper in my home? How do I become a worshiper that has worshipped all week long, and then when I come and gather with God's people, and we all have a similar heartbeat, we're tuned to the same tune of, God, you are amazing, because I've meditated on you all week, and now we get to worship together. How do I build that throughout the week? Well, the answer really is to meditate on God. You must abide in Him, to ponder on Him. If our meditation on God throughout the week is weak and tepid, then our worship will be weak and tepid. But if our worship of God and our meditation of God throughout the week if we meditate on Him and we, we ponder Him, and if that is vibrant and alive and growing, your worship of God will be alive and vibrant and strong. So last week we noted that true worship must start internal and work outward. But today I want to go beyond that as we looked at the foundation, and I want to say that it is this, that it is not true worship if it's only outward in the same regards if it never moves from the inward to the outward, then it's also missing elements of worship. Yes, it starts in the heart, but it ought to move out from there to my hands and my feet and, and my tongue to worship God in all different areas. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We want to look at worship's manifestation. Last week was worship's foundation. Today is worship's manifestation. And it's not true worship. It stays only inward. Reflection on God ought to cause us to be like the seraphim who are like before God, the angelic beings who, who go and, and go off and do it as bidding because they worship Him and they sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But yet when He says, go do this task, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 1 that they are like on a gyroscope and they, like a lightning bolt, go to do God's bidding and they serve. And so worship is, in, is an act, activity as well. We, we then become like, like Isaiah, who in Isaiah chapter number 6, as he, as he sees the Lord and his, and his throne, he, he hits the deck and falls on his face. And what does he say? He says, here am I, Lord, send me. God, you are amazing, and as I reflect on you, that works out to me surrendering to say, God, use me for whatever way you can. Because true worship will lead... Well, let's kind of do the syllogism this way. True meditation of God will lead to true worship of God, which will lead to true missions or service of God. That's the syllogism. That's the progression. If I really have a hunger, if I'm like the deer that pants for the water brooks, so my soul will pant after you, O oh God, and I will worship you, and that works out the same, then I will serve you. I want to live for you. So where does missions come from? Well, it comes... It comes from worship. That's where missions comes from. So last week, Jesus was our, our worship leader, so to speak, teaching us and giving us cues on worship. Today I want to take you to a different worship leader. 
I want us to get our cues from a different character of Scripture. Now, what's interesting is when we think of a worship leader, this character that we're going to look at never led congregational singing. Uh, He never played an instrument that we ever see recorded of. Uh, He never sang a special music in a congregational church gathering. The only time we actually see him musically leading worship was after he'd been beaten and chained up and was thrown in prison. That's none other than the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul gives so many cues on worship. He was, a, he was a genuine worshiper of God that worked out into worship in his service, in his hands. And truly, really, the things that he wrote have inspired probably more worship for the church than any other writer in the New Testament. When you consider his writings on the gospel and what God has done for us, what Christ has paid for us to purchase our redemption and how that leads to genuine worship. And and Paul was not just one who talked about these things and encouraged people to, to ponder that. He was one who thought about what God had done for himself. That he was unworthy of God's great grace. Whereas in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, here he says, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But what's he say after that in verse 10? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain, yet I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He says, God, you're amazing, this grace that you've given me, and it encourages me to live for you and to serve you. And so this morning, I want to take you to Philippians 1. Philippians 1, verses 19 to 26. We're going to specifically look at verses 20, or 20 and 21 uh, in more detail. But here he's actually writing to the, the church in Philippi, which is, Philippi was the place that he was in prison, and we, we find him actually singing with uh, uh, Silas in the prison cell. Well, now Paul is again in prison, but not in Philippi. He's in Rome, in prison, waiting for trial, and he's writing back to the Philippian church. A young church. A young group of believers who are starting to understand God's grace and what He has done for them. And they're concerned for their beloved Paul. They're concerned for this man who brought them the gospel. This one who taught them and, and was willing to put his life on the line to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And so let's, let's look back here at verse 19 and 20 and 21. He's, and so he says for them, as he's talking about his imprisonment and the difficulties of that, he says, For I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now notice this. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There's the verse before us. Now let's break the verse down for a moment before we jump into some points. Because I want you to see some, some critical aspects of what he's saying in this verse. There's some key words. First key word that I would highlight would be his earnest expectation. It's actually one word uh, in the Greek. Um, and and this, this word is apokaradakia. Uh, so the word kara means head and dakia means to stretch. So it has the idea of I'm leaning into, I'm stretching out after something. You ever, you ever watch sprinters? When, when they run a 100-yard dash or a 50-yard dash and, and they run, and at the end, what do they do? They, they lean out. Because their earnest expectation is they want to cross the line as best they can. That's their goal. They want to cross that goal. And and Paul is saying, my earnest expectation, my face is set, my heartbeat is after, my earnest expectation is what? Well, it's this. That Christ will be magnified. He says, I have an earnest expectation. My heartbeat is that I would be bold. I wouldn't be ashamed. And I would live it out for Christ so that Christ will be magnified. This is the heart of it. This is the root of it, of his desire to live for Christ. God, I want 
I want you to be exalted. I want you to be lifted high. The word magnified is a key word here. The word means to make great, to show to be great and glorious. So what Paul is saying is that his earnest hope, his passion, is that what he does with his body, he wants Christ to be magnified in my body. This isn't just a, uh, you know, in his spirit, he's going to worship God. He says, I want to be active. I want to be living this out in my body. His heartbeat is that no matter how, what it takes, no matter what the cost, that Christ would be lifted high. That's his earnest hope. Whether in life or death, he'll always be worshipped. And life and death is his mission. It's to magnify Christ. So what I want to break down then this morning is two different areas that he hits on in both, both verse 20 and 21. You'll notice that twice he hits these key themes, whether by life, or whether by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, what does that look like in the life of a person who wants to magnify Christ? What does that look like in the life of a believer who says, I want my life, no matter if it's even by death, I want Christ to be magnified. How do I take worship out now? How do I take worship out to every area of my life that Christ is magnified, no matter if it costs my life or whether it's through my life that Christ is magnified? Well, that's what we're going to dig into in just two points this morning. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at those together. Father, I do pray that you would guide our time. I thank you for the testimony of Paul, this man who had experienced grace. He was on his way to go persecute Christians, and yet you called him to your side. He responded by faith, and then he lived it out in his life as a true worshiper. And God, as we ponder this concept that we were made to worship, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand uh, what Paul is teaching here as he worships in his body, through his body, that you'd be magnified. Now, that's our heartbeat. We sang earlier that that the church be built and the earth be filled with your glory. And so God, would you press that in our hearts and minds, even on this day as we have ministries that are here, or that we would think about greater being involved in taking the gospel and spreading your glory to make more and more worshipers. Thank you for the privilege of being here together to study your word. Well, I pray your Holy Spirit have freedom and power to speak to hearts, and to give clarity to minds. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's look at the first part of this, and I'm going to work it backwards. I want to look at, first of all, what does it mean to, to, to glorify Christ by death, or to die as gain? So let's go, first of all, and look at Christ is magnified in our worship when dying is gain. So Paul says that dying is gain as it relates to Christ being magnified in his body. How is that possible? How is Christ magnified in my body if I die? How does that work? Well, let's look at first of all, in order to do that, you need to have a relationship with Christ for death to be gain. Because the inner essence of worship is satisfaction in God. Satisfaction in God, experiencing God greater by being with Him eternally is gain. You see, death is only a threat to us if it, if it upsets or ceases something that you value most, especially if that's temporal. But if we, what we value most and desire most is eternal, then death is not a threat to us. Death is only the continuation, is only, is only really the freedom to do more of what we desire and we're made to do. Does worship stop when we die? No. Worship is actually freed when we die. And so Paul has this idea that, well, I want to worship God in my body, and if that means death, that's okay. If I'm living for Christ, and that means it's going to cost me my life, that's okay. Why? Because he had understood and he had felt or he had walked with the experience of the satisfaction of God. And so if you value anything higher than true fellowship and knowledge of God, such as a job 
or golf or a hobby or a relationship or money or a toy, then death is not gain. Because death would be the cessation of that. Death then would be loss. But if our life is lived in satisfaction of God above everything else, if we truly have no other gods before Him, then worship continues. And so Paul valued Christ most. In fact, look over at verse 23. Go a little bit further down the page where he says, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He says, man, I mean, that is a desire of mine to be with Christ eternally. For true worshiper of God, death takes us into a greater intimacy with Christ. It allows us to be with Christ and glorify Him unhindered. That puts a new perspective on the things in this life. It puts a new perspective on how we're going to live and what really things get our excitement on this earth. I'm reminded of Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of God in the Old Testament. He's a unique character. We find him coming down off the the, the mountain of Tishbe area, and he comes down, he's wearing camel hair, and has a leather girdle about his waist, and he's just a unique guy. He's lived up in the mountains, and for him, he's, he's walked with God, he's had God speak to him, he's seen God, and all that he has created, and he has, he has walked into the cathedral of God's presence, and walked in that on this earth. And so he comes down to speak for God to the king. Oh, he walks into a palace. He walks into a royal room. There's, I'm sure, nice tapestries and floorings, and, and there is the, the throne there. And he comes up to Ahab. Is he impressed? No, not at all. He doesn't care about the tapestries. He doesn't care about who he is he's standing before. He says, I come and I speak for God. I am Elijah, and there will be no rain. He turns. He doesn't care what they think. He doesn't care that he's before a king. And he walks out and leaves. Why? Because for him, he had found his greatest satisfactions, his greatest goals, weren't to see if he could elevate himself and get to those high places and places of prominence. Because he had already walked with God. That was a cheap throne there on the earth. That's temporal tapestries. It won't last. He had seen the cathedrals of God's presence. He had seen all that God had made. He had seen God stretch out His tapestries across the skies with sunsets and sunrises. He had seen the the stars and and all of that. And and he 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 had worshiped God in that. I like the way that David says in Romans 8, when I consider the heavens the work of thy fingers. Do you realize the stars... The, the, the millions of galaxies are out there. It's finger work to God. The work of thy fingers. It's simple to God. And Elijah says, that's the God that I serve. That's my king. And so when I come down and talk to Ahab, oh, that's, that's little stuff to me. And so when we have great satisfaction in God, that changes our perspective. And so um, he calls... We serve a God who calls every star by name and leads them like a shepherd, yet He knows the very hairs of your head. He knows the very hairs of your head. And the Bible says in Psalm 139, He has thoughts towards you that are greater in number than the sand on the shore. That's an awesome satisfaction that I have in that God. And so Paul is saying, and I ponder all this, he says that makes me want to hunger and thirst after Him. And so, that's why we ought to come hungry for God. We far too often think of worship as a means of accomplishing something else. I will worship, we'll come and we'll we'll make vibrant worship in a corporate setting and and that will allow us to have a, a greater filled auditorium. Or that will allow us to raise more funds for this project. Or that will allow us to do this or to do that. But worship is an end in itself because God is an end in Himself. Worship is never an end to achieve something greater because He is the greatest. 
And so we don't worship God to gain something from that because it's out of response to that which we have already gained, which is God Himself. And so Paul says, for me then, dying is gain because I have a personal relationship with Him. And that's where it starts. If we're going to be true worshipers of God, have a vibrancy in worship of God, it starts with a personal relationship with Him. It terminates on God. And then dying is only gain because our greatest pleasure is worship, in worship is knowing Him and enjoying Him. But secondly, we also need to understand that the necessity that we must have, we need to be surrendered to Christ for death to be gained. You see, Paul isn't afraid of death. He's not concerned of that. He's not concerned with the cost that it might be to magnify God in his body. If we think about Paul's mindset, his mindset here, it motivates then a life of fearless service. A service like men like Elijah, men like Nathan, men like Samuel and Peter and Paul. I'm reminded of Paul earlier in, in, in uh, Acts 21. And he's on his way back to go to Jerusalem to proclaim Christ. And, and someone comes and, and, and they give him an announcement from God that the one who they bind his hands with will be bound in, in Jerusalem and will be taken and handed over to the Gentiles. And they bind up Paul's hands and it says, and the prophet says to him, you're the one that's going to be taken and bound if you go to Jerusalem. And everybody says, oh Paul, don't go. Don't do that. It's too high a price. And they are weeping and crying. And Paul says in Acts 21, he says, what mean these tears? Why are you all crying? I'm prepared to go to Jerusalem and to death if that means that God's name is glorified. If Jesus is lifted high, I don't care about my life. My life has been surrendered since the moment Jesus Christ got it on the road to Damascus. You see, if we surrender our lives and He is truly Lord of our lives, and we at salvation recognize it's not me, God. You are God above all things. You died on the cross and I accept what Jesus did for me and I'm going to make you Lord of my life. And then we live it for Him. Then dying truly is gain. We're not afraid of things. We're not afraid of, well, what they might think about me if I stand up and talk about Jesus Christ at my school. I'm not afraid about what they might say about me if in the lunchroom at my workplace if I begin to pull out my Bible and I start having Bible study and devotions there because I'm not concerned about that because my life is surrendered to Him. And if God can use me, it doesn't matter what the cost might be. And I'm not concerned if God wants to send me to some foreign country, which they supposedly say is a closed country, and it might be dangerous because if Jesus is magnified in my body, it doesn't matter if it costs me death because I want to live it for Him. It's all about Him. Where does that come from? Worship of God. Where does that come from? Meditation and satisfaction in God. If you develop a greater satisfaction in Him, where you abide in Him, and you meditate on Him, and you walk with Him, and you fellowship with Him, you can't help but worship. And then you won't be able to help but be involved in service of God. Dying becomes not a concern. Dying is gain. If Christ can, if Christ can be magnified through His death, and more people come to Christ through your death, well, that's, that's pleasure. That's great. You know, I've often thought about that. I've, I've spoken, I don't know how many funerals uh, throughout the years being a pastor. The last, one I, the last one I did here just a few weeks ago, um, it was such a pleasure to have someone respond afterwards. They came to me at the graveside and said, I want you to know, I want to thank you, because at the service... When, when you had us bow our heads, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You, you know what that death for that person was? Gain. Because even through the testimony of their life, as I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were the illustration of that, their death became gain. Because one of their loved ones came to know Jesus Christ. When we get that, 
when we begin to see past, we take the blinders off. Because so many times we run our race like this. Well, I've got to get this career step here, and I've got to do this thing here. And, and we, we have these blinders on. We take the blinders off and say, God, you see a much bigger picture. I will surrender to you and trust you. Well, then, living is Christ and dying is gain. And so there is no fear in that. It doesn't mean it's not going to be tough sometimes. But when you've surrendered to God, to God as we worship Him, and then we can trust God that even the hard times in service have a purpose. And so, Paul, we look here at Paul, and he has that idea. This is all about him. In fact, if you look back at verse 12, notice he says in verse 12, as he's talking about his imprisonment, Therefore, my beloved, as you have already always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, I'm sorry, that's chapter 2. Let me go back to chapter 1. I'm thinking, somehow he's getting to this, but I'm not seeing it. Chapter 1, we'll have it better. Chapter 1, verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, what? What's happened to him? He's in prison. He's waiting trial, and he may be executed, which he a little bit later is, which happened to me have actually turned out for what? For the furtherance of the gospel. He says that this has been great. God put me in prison. Isn't this great? And I'm chained to the Praetorian Guard. And you know what? These guys can't get away from me. Day after day, new guys have to come and sit to me, sit next to me, and I get to tell them about Jesus Christ. These guys who are high up, the Praetorian Guard, these are like the secret service. Uh, these are the top guys and in influential. Uh, these are the guys who help guard the, 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 the Caesars. And I've got them now stationed next to me, and I get to tell them about Jesus Christ. And they're coming to Christ. He says, man, this has been gain. It's all is gain. So there's where we have the idea that if Christ is magnified in our worship when dying is gain, let's see the other side of this now, where Christ is magnified in our worship when living is Christ. We kind of see how this ties together pretty easily when we just talked about that last part. But Paul says he wants Christ to be magnified in his body. So this is a, a physical living it out type of thing. And he says, whether by life. So, so what does living Christ in a way that your life is about magnifying Christ in worship look like? Well, I think we're going to see some, some links here. But notice, first of all there, that living Christ is founded on, again, personally loving Christ. It's founded on personally loving Him. When asked what the greatest commandment in the law was, Jesus responded in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Worship through your life is based upon what you love. What do you love? What do you love most? If living is going to be Christ, he needs to be what you love most. It's about who we are before God. So if we're going to live for Christ, it must first be found in a personal love for Christ. That means growing to know Christ intimately. It means growing to experience Christ as your all in all, Colossians 3.11. The great hymn writer Isaac Watts once wrote, The great God values not the service of men if the heart be not in it. The Lord sees and judges the heart. He has no regard for outward forms of worship if there be no inward adoration, if no devout affection be employed therein. It is therefore a matter of infinite importance to have the whole heart engaged steadfastly for God. He's right. It starts with a, an inward adoration, a love for Him. If there's no devout affection, then it doesn't work. It's been said before that what we love most will determine what we genuinely worship. Now think about that, because worship is an action. And I have seen people worship their cars. I, I, uh, when I was in college age, high school age, you know all those guys, they get their first vehicles, second vehicles, whatever, and they devote all their time I had, I had buddies who had their cars that were in magazines. And they, they were dumping all their energies, all their times in their car, and they loved it. It was their baby. I mean, they, they were infatuated with their vehicle. And they want to talk about 
their car. They wanted to show you their new latest things they put to their car. And they wanted to talk about how fast it could go. And they wanted to show you how they had put the air ride and it could lift up and go down. And they wanted to show you all the things it could do because it was their greatest love. You know, when Christ becomes your greatest love, you will see that worship becomes outward. What were those guys doing? Well, they were worshiping their car. And worship that's in the heart with our affections works outward. They invested their money. They invested their time. They talked about it. They lived for it. Well, if Christ is your greatest love, service of God and talking about Christ will be your greatest pleasure because worship comes out of that. So stop and consider a moment what, is your, what you love most. What is it that you really love most? There are things that are good for us to love. Our family, your church. Sometimes we love other things. Sometimes we, we love our technology. Sometimes we love relaxation. Not all those are bad things, but are they our loves before God? Over and over again, the Bible speaks about the dangers of idolatry, of putting anything else above and higher than God. Bob Coughlin, in his book, Worship Matters, states this, God wants us to love Him more than our instruments and music, more than our possessions, food and ministry, more than our wife and our children, more than our own lives. Jesus didn't say that we can't love anything else or that we shouldn't love anything else, but we can't love anything in the right way unless we love God more. That's a great statement. Do you realize that? You will never love your spouse in the right way unless you love Jesus Christ first and foremost. You will never love your children in the right way unless you love Jesus Christ first and foremost. So how do, how do we know what we love most? Well, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and look seriously at our lives. Look honestly outside of the Sunday morning. Look out the week and what do you enjoy doing most? What things bump out church? What things bump out your walk with God and daily time with Him? Where do you spend most of your time? Where does your mind drift to when you have time? Where do you spend your money on? What are you depressed without? What do you fear the most of losing? Those are good questions. And so it takes honest introspection to say, what do I really love? And Jesus said it plainly in Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be, the, be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So if you're going to live for Christ, you need to check if you are truly in love with Christ. And that's where then we come and magnify Him comes out of that. So living Christ is, first of all, is founded on a personal love for Christ. But then secondly, living Christ is fashioned on publicly proclaiming Christ. Here's where it starts to work out. Living Christ. So as we consider the whole verse of verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that what? That in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness. So I, I want to have the boldness to share Christ. So, then, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. We realize this is just another way of stating that the great goal of the Christian life, is, which is to glorify God by everything we are and do. He says, that's my heartbeat. He's talking about his witness being bold and not ashamed and with his life proclaiming the awesomeness of Christ. So worship is missions-minded and service-minded. We, we want to do everything we can to proclaim Christ. That's why we have this ministry fair today. We want you to find ways. We want to give you options and, and areas that you could say, man, I can serve Christ and talk to other people about Christ in these areas, whether it's to international students whether it's the kids who come in Belfont at the youth services, or whether it's going out of the nursing home and sharing with people there and, and telling them about Christ, or whether it's uh, volunteering at the local Christian academy and, and trying to minister to parents and families and kids and maybe serving lunch in the lunch line because we want to 
serve. We want it to be proclaiming Christ. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His wonders among all people. You see how that worship is tied to proclaiming to all people? Proclaim His glory. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, among the peoples. It's, it's linked up to worship. So if our greatest desire is to see Christ magnified, then missions is the way we see more people become worshipers of God. So we tell them. And we ought to serve the Lord, by the way, joyfully. You know, it's possible to be in service to the Lord and be doing it grudgingly. Well, what does that tell people about what we truly think about God? Uh, Charles Simeon said it well. He said, if you see a person grudging every labor that he performs, we naturally, naturally conclude that his task is irksome and that the master whom he serves is not, in his esteem at least, worthy of any high regard. But if we behold a person straining every nerve and exerting himself day and night in the most arduous services, and after all complaining only that he cannot perform one half of what he wishes to do for his master, we conclude, of course, that he loves both his work and his master too. The devotedness of the servant is a high and public commendation of his Lord. And so we ought to serve joyfully in the areas that we have an opportunity to serve. It's a pleasure. It's a joy. And so it's not just in our hands of service, but our whole body, he says here. That I want Christ to be magnified in my body, whether by life. It's a comprehensive and practical concept. It means that, that, that we may either exalt Christ or bring shame to His name by our attitudes, our words, our behavior. So, so what about our eyes? What do they look upon? What about our tongue? What does it say? Does it spread gossip? Does it spread joy? Does it spread encouragement? What about my ears? What do I listen to? Do I listen to encouragement? Do I listen, or do I listen to gossip? Do I listen to slander? Do I listen to things that will make me meditate and, and, and joyfully serve Christ? What about my feet? Where do they go? What about my hands? How do I serve? It's a whole body thing. So living Christ means that we desire to magnify Him through everything we do and say. And then lastly, living Christ is focused on selflessly serving others for Christ. Because Paul loved Christ, dying was gain. And he'd been thrilled to go with his Lord, but notice what he says then in verse 24 to 26. He says, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing in me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. He says, yes, it would be great joy, great gain for me if I were to go and be with Christ, but it is needful for me to be with you. And so living isn't about my greatest desires. Living is about, God, how can you use me? And he says here, really, as he's looking at the, talking to the Philippians, he says, man, my, my desire, I'm really in a battle here, because my desire is to go be with Christ. I am perfectly okay with that. But my life isn't about what I desire most. My life is about what he desires most. And so I will selflessly sacrifice, and if that means pressing on to get back to come to you, to encourage you in your walk of faith so that this church is strengthened so that more people magnify Christ that way, well, then I'm okay with that too. Because I'll selflessly serve others. You know, it's interesting. He's not even concerned about getting out of prison or not concerned about his own life, about what he's going through. He says, I want to live it for the Lord. You know, we're sometimes quick to plan out in detail every aspect of our days. We have our calendars and our goals, and those aren't bad if the whole objective is serving God and others over ourselves. Well, that's a main theme of joy and worship in the book of Philippians. 
Paul had recognized this brings great joy in worship. So today, as we wrap this up, we have the community ministry fair because we believe that Christians who genuinely adore Christ and, and, and meditate on Him and abide in Him will be genuine worshipers. That's the foundation of it. But we believe that the manifestation that the Bible teaches works out from there, from the inward, as we worship Him in spirit and truth, it works out now into our hands that Christ might be magnified in our body, whether by life or by death. And so the aspect there is in the manifestation is in my life, as I go and do things, am I looking for opportunities to live for Christ? Am I looking for opportunities to serve others and to magnify Christ and everything that I do and where I go and that I say? Why? Because He's worthy. Because He's worthy. It all boils down to that. Worship is, to, is based upon reflecting back that which He is worthy of to the one who is worthy of it. And so we encourage you to get plugged in. We encourage you to come and serve at the day when we're, or the week when we're, we're going to be building the missions house and working on it. We encourage you to get involved in Awanas. We encourage you to get involved in, in, in the soup ministry. We encourage you to, 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 to serve. Find ways to magnify God in your body. Pray about it. Look at how God's gifted you. Look at how God can use you and pray that God would lead you there. The great hundred psalm states this. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with, good, with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Let's pray. Father, we praise You that You are our God and we are the sheep of Your pasture. We praise you that you are a God who is over all things, created the stars, ordains them and leads them like a shepherd, and yet you care and know every detail about us. And God, as we as, we as a people of God, God, I pray that you'd help us to, to, to fertilize and grow and nurture our love and admiration and and just a, a, an awe of you. As we meditate on you and your goodness, your greatness, that then we would respond naturally, that it would just become natural to, to magnify you. And God, I pray that magnification would be like Paul here, that with our bodies, we would by life or by death, we would bring you glory. And so God, I pray that you would guide us, help us as we analyze that and see areas of our lives that we might worship you and live for you or that we might point and direct others to become true worshipers god you are truly worthy you are truly worthy of all that we could give you and we give you praise this morning it's in christ's name we pray amen